Hey folks, next up on This Week in Law, it's been an incredible week. The D.C. Circuit finally ruled in the Verizon versus FCC case. We've got two amazing people to help unpack the nuances of that decision, which are many. James Grimmelman and Jeff Manny are joining me and Evan Brown. We're going to talk about that. We're also going to look at, in detail at the grant of cert the Supreme Court has given us in the Aereo case. The Supreme Court's going to hear that case, and we're going to attempt to ballpark what might happen. We'll talk about Google Book Search and Driving with Glass 2 next on This Week in Law. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. And with for This Week in Law is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twill, This Week in Law with Denise Howell and Evan Brown, episode 242, recorded January 17th, 2014. A box without a puppy. Hi, folks, Denise Howell here, and you're joining us for This Week in Law. You picked a great week to join us because the courts have sure been busy. We have two amazingly bright people to help us understand and get our heads around uh, what has been going on on a number of fronts, uh, net neutrality and aereo being uh, the forefront in my mind right now. Uh, Joining us from the University of Maryland, where he is head of the intellectual property program and also a lecturer uh, at their Institute for Education advanced computer studies in case you were at all questioning his geek cred at all you cannot do that with james grimmelman hello james hi it's great to have you back on the show oh it's it's always wonderful and uh, also joining us from the international center for law and economics uh he's also a senior fellow at tech freedom and are you still lecturing at lewis and clark law school as well jeff not at the moment no not at the moment. Okay, so we're going to scratch that one off your bio, but we're thrilled that you're here. Jeff Mann. Manny, thank you. Manny, yeah, so sorry. Great. No, that's okay. Do you okay. think it's... after all of your uh, appearances <laughs> the show, I would get that right, but um, next time I promise I'm going to nail it. Uh, we've had some Skype difficulties. It was uh, my turn last week. It's Evan's this week, so we're going to get Evan Brown uh, from the Internet Info, uh, Info, uh, Info Law Group uh, on the show as soon as we can, my co-host. Uh, But until he's here, we're going to go ahead and launch into our discussion of the net neutrality ruling out of the D.C. Circuit this week. Uh, For those of you uh, and lots of people have been waiting for the other shoe to drop there in the Verizon lawsuit, it dropped. And uh, the ruling was not too surprising to anyone who followed the oral argument in the case where the court seemed to be telegraphing that it was going to rule for Verizon it largely did, but there is a lot of nuance to the decision. Uh, Jeff, why don't you give us your overview take on it first? Sure, thanks, Denise. Um, so, uh, without uh, too much boring explication of uh, Section 706, as uh, James already warned me against, um, let me uh, uh, just sort of shoot right to the the conclusion and I, what I think its implications are. So, I think what's most interesting here, most important anyway is that while the court did strike down the most important parts of the open internet order, um, the blocking provision and the non-discrimination provision, uh, it did so only after finding that the FCC did indeed have authority to regulate internet service providers, to regulate broadband as an information service under the so-called section 706 of the Communications Act. Um, So what the court did then was to determine that the open internet order isn't going to stand as it was currently written. Uh, but it also just determined, again, that the FCC has this authority. And that's hugely important because uh, while uh, there are many out there who, of course, wanted the open internet order to stand as it was written, um, that it was struck down while the court nevertheless upheld the uh, general overall authority of the FCC to regulate in this realm um, means that the FCC can come back and try again. Uh, it means that the FCC has been has been it, its power has been confirmed by the court to extend well beyond uh, the scope of the uh, net neutrality rules uh, that were at issue in this case, potentially implicating the Internet of Things and a whole range of regulations of uh, broadband 
service that that haven't yet been even attempted by the FCC. Um, and then I would just uh, just sort of to finish this introduction, point out that the grounds on which the court decided that the open internet order itself exceeded the FCC's authority was that it looked too much like common carriage regulation. <clears throat> that um, uh, that means that. Uh, the FCC can, as I suggested, come back and offer a different set of uh, net neutrality principles uh, that at least don't go as far as uh, the, the open internet order, that don't bump up against the common carriage rules. But there's, I think, a lot of daylight between nothing and the open internet order. Um, and as I suggested in an op-ed I wrote with uh, Baron Soka in, in Wired uh, yesterday or the day before, um, it also means that the FCC, because of its newfound or newly uh, substantiated authority under 706, it means that the FCC can come in and essentially, I think as a practical matter, adopt common carriage-like regulation on an adjudication basis, on the basis of individual enforcement actions, um, even though the court struck down treating broadband providers like common carriers. I think if they do it on an individual basis uh, in, in as a suggested a succession of enforcement actions, they could actually accomplish the same thing that the court said that they couldn't do in the form of a, uh, of a rulemaking. So in the end, I think, um, I, I personally think for worse, but some may think for better, the, the FCC comes out as the real winner here. Okay, let's define some terms before we go on so that uh, I and other folks listening uh, know exactly uh, what we're talking about when we begin to discuss the nuances of this decision. Um, we have this distinction uh, and, and a path laid out by the court for the FCC to continue to uh, regulate in this area, as you suggested, Jeff, but it's going to have to try and reclassify broadband services from telecommunication services to no, inf information services under Title I and Title II of the Telecommunications <clears throat> Act. Am, am I going somewhere that makes sense there? Yeah, no, I, I don't. Th I, I think I don't think that's quite right. So, okay, uh, w one of the um, one of the the options following the court's ruling is that the FCC could reclassify broadband services under Title II. Uh, mm -hmm. Currently, they're regulated under Title I, which is a much um, a much more uh, lax regulatory provision. Title II actually allows for, uh, in fact, uh, encompasses uh, um, the, the primary elements of common carrier regulation. It's where telephones, it's a telecommunication service, it's the way telephones have always been regulated. And the FCC has, on several occasions, said they weren't going to treat information services, broadband providers, for example, as um, uh, telecommunication services under Title II. That's in fact exactly why the court said that the open internet order went too far. Had the FCC been treating them as telecommunication services under Title II, then the, impl the, uh, uh, the um, implementation of common carrier type provisions wouldn't have been in any way problematic. So what some people have been suggesting is that um, if the FCC doesn't have the authority under Title I, to uh, enact the open internet order, well then, uh, if that's because the FCC has said broadband providers need to be uh, regulated under Title I and not Title II, then they should reclassify broadband services as telecommunication services, regulate them under Title II, which would then mean that the open internet order was perfectly fine. Um, again, I think that's a terrible idea. I think it's a political non-starter as well. I don't think there's any chance of it actually happening. But um, uh, but I think the idea that the FCC, the claim that some have made that the FCC should regulate broadband providers under the extraordinarily onerous provisions of Title II would be a, a, a huge um, imposition of cost and, and pain on uh, on consumers. The, the Internet just doesn't need and, and uh, uh, wouldn't benefit from that kind of regulation. James, I can see why the FCC is struggling with the classification question here, uh, because it seems to me difficult to decide that broadband services are one or the other. Uh, do you agree? The District of Columbia Circuit mm -hmm. gave the FCC a beautiful gift wrap present 
in terms of saying that it has the authority to regulate all kinds of aspects of broadband service. Yeah. But the box turned out not to contain the puppy that the FCC really wanted more than anything else. <laughs> so now they're staring at it and trying to figure out what to do. And while it's true that they could make kind of a cobbled together argument that this new authority could let them have non-blocking and non-discrimination rules that somehow are different from common carriage, I'm not really sure how far that will go. I've heard rumblings that they think they can do it. I'm not sure that the new authority goes that far. If they were to go ahead and reclassify it, as Jeff has been discussing, that doesn't just mean non-discrimination and non you can't block websites. That would also give the FCC power to control the rates that broadband providers charge. And that's, that's a mess. I don't see the FCC wanting to go there. On the other hand, the argument that that's a political non-starter has always been a bit strange to me. Because given the enormous gridlock in Congress right now, it's true that the FCC couldn't go back to Congress and plead for a puppy. But if the FCC shows up and says, oh, hey, we have this puppy, by the way, I don't see Congress and the president sufficiently getting together to take it away from them. I think congressional inaction gives them the cover they would need to use if they were going to get, go ahead and do reclassification. So a lot of this seems to be about the optics and the personal views of the FCC commissioners more than anything else. Okay. Gavin, do you want to give your take on the DC Circuit's decision and, and uh, ramifications thereof before we get a little bit more into the details? Uh, the, my only take on it is it's extremely complex. And, you know, I don't practice telecommunications law. I just look at this as as a commentator, try to see the big picture issues in it here. And so I guess I'm curious, my, my, you know, the, the thing that I do in situations like this when I don't know precisely uh, how to how to comment on it, adding any substance is to ask the questions of, you know, how this is going to play out in the next phase of things. We've got a new power in the FCC with a new commissioner, Commissioner Wheeler. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, my, my take, my approach on it is to wonder where this is going to go at a large scale uh, uh, you know, framework, uh, you know, the questions that are asked at that large scale framework. Um, with that, I guess I would just want to follow up with James on something there. Um, it, I, I didn't quite catch it on in the metaphors, probably because I wasn't listening well enough, but what is the puppy in that metaphor? <laughs> I, I mean, I like it. It's going to work, but I didn't catch what exactly the puppy are you is. asking, is one of us a dog in this situation? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there, that nobody can tell. It, it sounds like somebody is somewhere. <laughs> the puppy is net neutrality. The FCC has been trying to get one for years. And they really, I think, mean no blocking and no systematic discrimination in favor of the ISP's own affiliates. They don't really like the idea that an ISP that also has some content partners would decide to charge everybody else more and give its own services a free pass or just block particular websites or applications that it doesn't like. One of the things about the open internet order is that we really haven't seen that much in the way of attempts by ISPs to push at the limits of it. It's not as though the challenge was motivated by something that Verizon really wanted to do and now can't. There hasn't been a lot of appetite for really pushing at the boundaries of this. We've seen some experiments with data caps and what services count against that more in the wireless space. But I wonder whether this is a big fight over very little in that it's not as though there are many services that are really being held back by this just given where the market is. I, you know, I, I tend to, to agree to a certain extent. It's one of the reasons why I think the really big story here is the, um, uh, is the upholding of the general 706 authority. Uh, I'm not sure that net neutrality is such a, the open internet order was going to be so onerous in and of itself or that it was uh, pre preventing uh, a huge range of otherwise consumer welfare enhancing things. It might have been. Uh, obviously, it has to have exerted some deterrent effect. But uh, um, I, you know, I agree with James. I'm not sure that it was all that substantial. Um, uh, 
It might have been, again, it might have been. But um, but the authority they now have under Section 706, or that they had, but the court has affirmed under uh, 706, that you know is um, uh, raises the potential for a whole, I think, a whole host of of regulatory interventions by the FCC uh, that could indeed be be catastrophic or to be a little bit uh, less hyperbolic, at least problematic for uh, ISPs, content providers, edge providers, and consumers alike. Um, uh, I'll, I'll stop talking, but, I, but I'll, I'll just throw out there that Evan, uh, I, thought, I think your question is the right question, and I'd be happy to take a few minutes to um, uh, sort of lay out what I think happens next, what the implications of this are, what the FCC can do uh, now, given the, the ruling as it stands. I definitely want to go there, but but before we do, I, I want to make sure that uh, I and everyone listening understand uh, the playing field as it sits here today, as opposed to what's going to happen uh, down the road and and what this decision did and, and uh, the, the nuances of it. As you were just saying, Jeff, uh, Verizon lost on one of its main arguments, uh, and that is that the FCC had overstepped its authority entirely in attempting to regulate in this area. And, and the court uh, under Section 706 said, no, 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 that's not the case. The FCC can regulate in this area, but they've gone too far in the way they've done it here for this particular classification of service. Mm -hmm. um, so... I agree, you know, as we've been saying, that's the part that is the, the gift to the FCC. Um, let's talk for a second before we move on about the difference between wireless and wired broadband, uh, because that's a, a big distinction here. Obviously, the world is headed toward more uh, internet use being done on wireless, but for the time being, at least, uh, businesses, homes, schools, libraries primarily are using wired internet. So it's still relevant. And, and uh, James, why don't you uh, explain for people why that matters in the context of this discussion? The FCC, when it went and passed the open internet order, the one that was just overturned, it looked at the differences between wired and wireless broadband and concluded that while it was going to apply the no blocking rules to both of them, it was only going to prevent discrimination among speed or other quality of service on wired internet. So your wireless ISP, your smartphone provider, would be free to have a fast lane for certain kinds of data, would be free to charge providers more for preferential access that gets to you faster. But your wired connection, the one you use at home, would be subject to more stringent equal treatment rules that all the services have to be given equal priority. So even before this decision came out then at CES, we saw AT&T announcing its sponsored data arrangement or, or you know, putting this notion out there where, you know, we're going to, um, you know, count, counter to what uh, the, the net neutrality doomsday people think. We're not going to try and block out services like Facebook or Netflix or Spotify, these bandwidth intensive services. We know that's what you, our consumers, really want to get to. That would be shooting ourselves in the foot. What we're going to do instead is make sure that you get the best possible access to these bandwidth intensive services that you love. And we're going to partner up with them. And we're going to exclude certain services perhaps from our data caps um, so they were able to do that before this decision ever came out because, as you were just discussing, James, uh, the, the non-discrimination portion of the open internet uh, order never even applied in the wireless realm. Is that right? Yeah, that's okay. the basic framework there. And I should okay. point out that when we talk about bandwidth intensive services, this is really about video and to a lesser extent audio. Mm -hmm. Your Facebook connection, even if you are on your phone checking Facebook every second of every day, you are just not burning significant bandwidth looking at text and pictures. Right, exactly. Okay, so uh, let's now go to uh, Evan's question and Jeff's 
waiting in the wings response to um, what we're going to see happen now? Uh, okay, so I think there's, I think there are four options. Um, uh, there's probably more than four, but I'm going to talk about four. One is that uh, the FCC comes back uh, with a um, essentially a revised open internet order, a, a next attempt at the net neutrality rules following the blueprint that the court has just given them. Um, Tom Wheeler has made a couple of, uh, uh, the, the FCC chairman has made a couple of comments following the court's ruling. Uh, and one of them suggests that uh, they'll certainly be looking at uh, how to issue a revised ruling, a revised <laughs> set of regulations that would uh, comply with the court's limitations. The the second option, the not, uh, not, most of these are not mutually exclusive either. Uh, the second option I alluded to earlier, that is proceeding on a case by case basis. So for example, um, uh, uh, and and this case by case basis approach could actually ultimately exceed the uh, the scope of the open internet order. And what we were just talking about actually presents uh, a, a good example of this. Um, I'm not saying there's <coughs> any reason to think they're going to do this, but but it wouldn't entirely surprise me if the FCC decided to take a look at the sponsored data program. And that might very well have been perfectly permissible under the open internet order, which itself wouldn't have precluded another action by the, uh, by the FCC, but probably would have made it unlikely. Now that that's struck down, you could certainly imagine the FCC taking a look at the sponsored data program and applying its, its new found authority under section 706 um, to, uh, uh, perhaps um, uh, adjust the contours of it or suggest that it creates problems and, and needs to be changed or simply to ban it outright. And if they do that in such a way that they don't suggest that they are treating AT&T as a common carrier, um, and I think there are plenty of ways they can do that, um, I think that they would be well within the scope of their power under Section, 07, Section 706 to do so. Um, and that might be the, again, I have no reason to think that they're going to pursue the, the sponsored data program. But uh, that might be the first of a whole series of uh, individual enforcement actions that could ultimately add up to something even greater than the open internet order. Um, the third thing is re possibility is reclassification, as we were talking about before. Um, uh, it's it's you know James's points are are fair. Um, uh, I do think it's a political non-starter. I actually think that if the FCC tried to reclassify um, infra broadband uh, services as telecommunication services under Title II, I think you would see an enormous amount of energy and uh, sufficient um, unanimity on the part of Congress to to stop that. Um, but regardless, that's an option. I don't think it's going to happen. I think Wheeler has intimated that he's not likely to pursue that course. But of course, you never know. Um, and then I want to mention one other option. Well, I should say one other option is, of course, do nothing. Um, I wish that regulators far more frequently adopted the do nothing option, but they tend not to. Uh, so I'll add as a fourth option, uh, pursuing uh, net neutrality type problems under an antitrust standard. Um, and the FTC and the DOJ a long time ago have both suggested that they would and could pursue a lot of the kinds of problems that people worry about in the net neutrality context text, most obviously an ISP degrading, let's say, Netflix um, solely in order to benefit its own competing offering. Uh, uh, again, the DOJ and the FTC have both suggested they'd be interested and able to pursue those as antitrust violations. And frankly, the FCC could do that as well. Uh, there's no reason that the FCC couldn't adopt an antitrust sort of standard to address these net neutrality problems. And frankly, I think that would be the the best outcome. Uh, I think to the extent that net neutrality type issues are problematic, they are only problematic to the extent that there is an abuse of market power that results in a threat to harm to competition uh, and harm to consumers. And that's what antitrust is made to deal with. I don't think we needed the open internet order in the first place, particularly because it would reach a lot of things that, um, that shouldn't be outlawed and shouldn't be deterred. Uh, which of those is the most likely sort of next step, I, I don't really know. I, if I had to put my money on it, I would probably vote that, or I would probably put my money on uh, the FCC pursuing this sort of piecemeal uh, enforcement action approach uh, in order to see kind of how far they can go and, and what they're able to do. Which is implicit in your, your 
projection or your your you know what, surmising of what might happen there. I, implicit in that is sort of a rejection of the notion that reclassification is off the table. And I've I've heard you say that, and and that seems to be bouncing around in a lot of commentary that that's a political non-starter or that would just be way too freighted for Chairman Wheeler or, or what have you on that. I'm wondering if we could explore that just a little bit as to why classification is so politically or would be so politically challenged. Because one of the things that I learned in reading this most recent opinion from the, the D.C. Circuit is more about the history of how the distinction between telecommunications services and information services came about. It goes all the way back 30 plus years, right? Um, with, uh, you know, some, some different developments. And I think the fundamental notion was, is that, and, you know, this is all new knowledge to me, so I'm just testing it out and hopefully you can correct and, and <laughs> add to it as, as, uh, as necessary for all of our edification here. But it was that telecommunication services like the telephone in particular required a heavy touch from the FCC, heavy regulation, whereas mm -hmm. information services required only a lighter touch because they, uh, I guess, presumably weren't as essential to what it is that we do every day. You, you, in 1980, in, for example, you didn't try to you know, call the police using your computer. <laughs> I, I don't know right. if you still do that now, but you know, there was 911 on the telephone and then there was all this other stuff that you were doing with information processing. And so that is the historical basis, the genesis for this distinction, whereas now, Fast forward to 2014, that distinction, at least as I'm seeing it, and if you're looking at it from the starting point that that these sorts of activities that we do, uh, and that's the, the the generic term for the the types of services that we use, whether they be telecommunication service or information processing services, the things that erstwhile have been known as information processing services have become very fundamental. So it seems only logical that reclassification would make good logical sense. Why is it that you know, if that premise is correct, why is it that it would be such a, a difficult political challenge uh, these days to, to get it reclassified so it would satisfy this impulse that we have for the open internet? Uh, well, I, uh, I, I think that it's not uh, just the um, uh, sort of the, the necessity of the service that leads to the, the, the imposition of more onerous regulation. I think it's the um, the characteristics of the market and the assumption, in fact, the reality, of course, back in the Ma Bell days, that um, that the important service that's being regulated is a monopoly and is prone to abuse of that monopoly. In the case of telephone services, it was a government-granted monopoly. There was no question that it was a monopoly. Uh, and uh, there was essentially no room for any competition whatsoever. And in a situation like that, if you want to make sure that this this monopoly service is, um, is being offered, Offered, uh, because we think it's so important being offered and accessible to uh, citizens broadly, uh, then it might make sense to impose some sort of onerous regulation to ensure that. When it comes to broadband services, there's no question in my mind that we're dealing with an entirely different uh, market situation. Competition is 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 pretty rampant, despite the fact that government has done its best to 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 limit it uh, uh, through local franchise authorities that give. Um, that gives a certain cable providers in certain areas a monopoly, uh, a monopoly over uh, local cable provision. Despite that, there's an enormous amount of competition here. There's an enormous percentage of the country that has access to more than one ISP. There's the uh, current and increasing competition between wireless and wired uh, provision, as Denise alluded to earlier. Um, and there's no evidence at all to suggest that even before the open internet order was enacted, any of the sorts of threats that are uh, being worried about in the open internet order were actually occurring. One of the most amazing things about this case is you have this open internet order, this huge document that in part is meant to, um, to lay out the evidentiary basis for the need for uh, net neutrality regulation. And uh, as um, uh, both the majority and the the dissent in the in the case acknowledge um, there, there's almost no evidence of any problem here. The majority decided under under the Chevron doctrine as a matter of administrative law that it had to give deference to the FCC's assertion that there was um, a problem here in need of correcting. Uh, but even it acknowledged that this was pretty thin. It's just that the legal standard is is essentially non-existent. Um, so we have a, a, a 
a manifestly, to me, fairly competitive market in which, as James also pointed out, none of the problems have ever occurred. Um, there's just no basis for applying an onerous regulatory regime in that set of circumstances. Um, and it would be onerous. And so the answer to the other part of your question, why it would be politically infeasible, I think that the the not only the broadband service providers, not only the wireless uh, providers, but also the content companies or a lot of the content companies themselves, um, I think would, um, uh, would find that to be a... Um, a, an assertion of government authority over the internet, not dissimilar to uh, you know, what the NSA has been doing, what we fear the International Telecommunications Union might do, a real government takeover of the internet that would ultimately be so bad for the internet that just about everyone uh, would try to fight it. And I think there would be enough business interest uh, and, and consumer interest against this that, that, that Congress would, would rally to the cause. Yeah, it's it's such a hard issue. And I, I have, on the reclassification question, I have trouble I, thinking that classifying broadband services as either telecommunications or information services makes any sense at all. Because as Evan was saying in the run-up to his question there, they it, it can be so much both. And so to have artificial distinctions between the two and how it's regulated depending on what box you put it in uh, doesn't make sense to me right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. um, that there, there shouldn't be, you know, distinctions and long-term differences in the way that broadband can be regulated just because of what you decide to call it. Um, but, but leaving my sort of cognitive dissonance with that aside, uh, <laughs> I, 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 uh, I I've been reading a lot of the materials around um, sponsored data and, and trying to do my own thinking about, okay, so what's going to happen in the future if, if the market is allowed to just sort of develop in an unregulated way? Um, certainly there are market pressures on ISPs to offer consumers the services that they want. Uh, but I think what people... Fear is that, uh, well, I think they're twofold, that, that the little guys are going to be um, left out of these big deals on sponsored data and that there may be no incentive um, for consumers to buy anything above and beyond what sponsored <clears throat> data be, may be able to provide them. You know, you buy, you buy your phone service, you have access to a number of very well-known services through your sponsored data plan. But uh, something like our network here uh, might not be within that large player playing field. Uh, and, and perhaps people might not even have access to those things anymore. Do you see that as a danger, James? I just don't see people having a lot of commercial interest in going without a whatever you can get to internet. Mm -hmm. That is, if somebody's offering a service under which you can only get Facebook and Twitter and Hulu and a couple of other major services, that's proven in the market not to be very appealing. What I'm more concerned about is extortion of a few individual providers. So that you say, oh, your service has gotten really successful. You've got a lot of bandwidth. You've got a nice business model there. Shame if something were to happen to it. That is... They start to strike the deals that would take somebody out unless they get paid. Now, the economics of this are really complicated because you have people on the one hand paying for access. On the other side, you have the websites and services that they're trying to reach. It's not fully clear exactly how that shakes out. But I think that that threat by itself is so ugly. And to be honest, ISPs are so mistrusted that people can see that, oh, yeah, they're the most thuggish players in the industry. Wouldn't be beyond them to do it. Hmm. So regardless of whether they would actually do this, people think they would. And the fear of threats like that is what provides a lot of the political su support for trying to have rules in place to stop them from doing it. In terms of the politics, it may just be that as long as the FCC keeps on huffing and puffing and trying to pass a rule every time the previous one gets struck down, that might be enough of a chill to keep 
the real nightmares from coming to materialize. That is, it may be that we're in the equilibrium right now of the FCC threatening to take action and trying to do so, and that creates enough of a chill that nothing really terrible happens. This is not not the end of the world if that's where we end up. Well, this, this is why I think, um, uh, again, while, while, while I'm uh, fearful of the outcome of this case, those who support net neutrality and those who have the, the more reasonable sort of uh, concerns that, that James expressed rather than the sort of knee-jerk um, uh, uh, fear that, that ISPs are trying to take over the world, um, should be really happy with this ruling. What this ruling says is the, the FCC has the power to deal with those problems if they arise. Now, that's very clear in this case. Maybe they can't have done it through the imposition of a an ex-ante um, prohibition on all kinds of activities that might uh, otherwise have proved to be quite valuable. But if something harmful happens, I, I'm... I'm fairly, I'm very confident in saying that the the holding in this case is that if something really problematic happens and the FCC wants to deal with it, they can. And um, as I said before, there's no evidence that anything problematic has ever occurred here. I mean, there's a couple of tiny examples that that you know in the in the ten years of relationship between ISPs, uh, broadband ISPs, and and edge providers, there's example, you know, four examples, only about two of which amount to anything at all, um, suggests that there isn't a really big problem here. So well, I, can I, I, you know, I think those people should should be really happy with this ruling. I'm can not. I ask you a little bit about that? that that's really intriguing, that, and, I, and I've heard you say that a couple of times. How would you go about even measuring something like that. You, know, you said something provocative like the open internet order, the 2010 open internet order really hadn't, did you say it hadn't really provided that many benefits or something, I mean, something along those lines. I mean, aren't we really trying to measure a negative here? And, you know, what are the criteria for measuring the net benefit for, for well, something I, like I was, that? I was trying to say that before the imposition of the open internet order, um, uh, there was not very much evidence, there was very scant evidence that any of the kinds of problems that the open internet order purported to be dealing with were actually problems. Once the open internet order was in place, th then you're absolutely right, you know, to, to sort of look at what happened since then, it's very hard to tell um, uh, what would have happened had it not been for the open internet order. But, uh, as, you know, as James suggested a while ago, um, I think the best most likely answer there is not a whole lot. It, the, you, we don't see ISP sort of chomping at the bit to try to do the kinds of things that people are really worried about here. So my main point was that before the open internet order, this this kind of problematic conduct wasn't occurring. Um, now, James made a good point just a minute ago, suggesting that the mere threat of uh, 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 the availability of FCC intervention and the threat that the FCC might do something could very well have been what was um, preventing the worst non-neutrality abuses from occurring. But then I'll reiterate what I said a second ago. If that's the case, we're still in that world because the court just said they still have that power under 706. Um, so uh, I think there wasn't any problem that needed to be addressed beforehand, at least no evidence that it had occurred yet. Um, and we're still in a world in which the FCC clearly has sufficient power to deal with any problems that arise um, should they actually have ultimately arise. We had Susan Crawford on the show back in October uh, discussing, it was right about the time the case was argued, um, discussing uh, what might happen. And uh, she is very much of the opinion that the FCC has to reclassify um, and that it's just not going to be enough to leave this to the marketplace uh, because high-speed internet access is such an essential part of our lives now. Um, she did a great AMA along with Marvin Amori and uh, who else was in this? Tim Wu and uh, Josh Levy um, over on Reddit. They did an AUA, I guess it is. Um, but she reiterated that point there that, that the FCC is just gonna have to reclassify and that uh, we can't leave this to the marketplace. And it, it seems to, that her concern, and um, for those interested, she elaborated quite a bit when she was on, us, on the show back in October. I think that was episode 233. Palante Funkadelic is the title of the show. Um, mm. So uh, it seems that her concern is, is uh, not so much over uh, the, you know, gating and giving preferential treatment to... Uh, certain 
bandwidth intensive uh, services if they pay the piper for it. Uh, but with access to broadband, fundamentally, that, that that is impacted by this decision. Do you agree, Jeff, that it is? I I don't. Uh, I think mm -hmm. that the the um, the FCC was required in order to to assert its authority under 706. The FCC was required to make this argument. The court and the dissent both call it a, a triple cushion shot argument. That um, I, I, I'm happy to unpack it, but I, I won't unless you tell me you want me to take the time to do so. But they they had to make the argument that net neutrality regulation. Uh, was necessary in order to preserve, indeed, the incentives for investment in broadband infrastructure and the provision of broadband services to all citizens in America. Um, again, e even the majority recognized that this was uh, a tenuous and, and um, uh, uh, frankly, utterly unsupported argument. Um, it's theoretically possible. But there's just no evidence that it actually would, that that connection is actually there, that we won't get broadband offered to everyone unless we impose strong net neutrality regulations that ensure that no content can ever be blocked and, and that uh, no content can ever be discriminated against. I, if I understand what you just said, you're, you're suggesting that Susan was, was um, saying, indeed, that's the reason we need net neutrality rules, not because of the, the um, d direct effect on, on edge providers themselves, but rather because of this indirect effect on the in incentives to, to ensure that broadband is widely and, and um, uh, uh, sufficiently available to everyone. And I, well, here, I see no evidence. I don't, I don't want to um, misstate her position. So let me just read it from the Reddit AUA. She says, high speed internet access is far too important as an essential infrastructure mm -hmm. input to our national economy and to our civic, social, and personal well being to leave it solely to a failed market with no government oversight or fundamental rules of the road. FCC will have to reclassify. But that's just not true, right? So, so the FCC does indeed regulate uh, broadband services under Title I. Title I is indeed it's a title of the communications act it may not be as as onerous as title two but there's a lot in there uh and meanwhile as i've been saying section 706 preserves for uh the fcc the ability to impose i think an almost limitless uh range of uh, uh of regulations on information service providers now so um uh the the claim that that there uh, Absent the reclassification, the FCC doesn't have the uh, ability or the authority to regulate is incorrect. She may be ultimately really trying to say that she thinks they need to be able to regulate more than they can clearly do under mm -hmm. uh, Title I. And, you know, I mean, that's an argument we've been having for a, for a long time. We've had some of it today. I totally disagree. But um, but that's that's very different than saying the FCC doesn't have any power at all. We have not left this to a quote unquote failed market. Um, the FCC is very much a player here. Yeah, as I try and wrap my head around the whole sponsored data approach that AT&T tossed out there at CES and that others uh, may be interested in pursuing as well, um, it's, it, you know, I, it's hard to know exactly how it would shake out. But it seems to me that the efficiencies there could favor the consumer, that you know, there's sure. no reason to pay for, um, you know, data on your Wi-Fi hotspot, data on your phone, um, always worried about um, whether or not you're consuming, you know, more than you should be and you're going to get hit with onerous fees, uh, that if the uh, behind the scenes, the ISPs can work mm -hmm. with the, the people who are the most broadband intensive folks out there, uh, that ultimately it could benefit the consumer and, and that leaving some of that to the marketplace to see how it shakes out um, is a good idea as long as it can't, you know, it can't go off the rails right. and there's some sort of check on it. I think that's a good way to put it. I think that you highlighted exactly what I think the difference is between um, net neutrality regulation and an antitrust approach to uh, the sorts of problems that uh, that might arise under uh, net, net neutrality. And that is that net neutrality is an ex ante prohibition on all kinds of conduct, a lot of which, like the sponsored data program, may very well be great for consumers. So, mm -hmm. um, 
And you know that, that just doesn't really make a lot of sense when there's no evidence to suggest that it's happened before. We'd be much better off in a world where where these kinds of experiments take place. And if they turn out to be problematic, then uh, we have the antitrust rules to deal with them ex post or the FCC to deal with them in an enforcement action. And both of those are still available. So again, the claim that there's no regulation left here is, um, uh, is just incorrect. So James, uh, a couple of questions to, I guess, sort of begin to bring this discussion in for a landing. Um, do you think that the FCC will try uh, to move forward on this in the short term? Or do you think that um, the, the market will just have its way for a while? They've signaled quite strongly that they're going to go ahead with something in this mm -hmm. space. It looks like they're going to use the 706 authority to try to do something short of the full common carrier, full reclassification. But mm -hmm. they will try to reimpose at the very least, no blocking, and I'm, I guess likely, some kind of restriction on discrimination. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a slightly weaker version than before. Maybe if they would allow for more selling of exemptions from data caps, provided they were mm -hmm. done even-handedly. That's possible. But the FCC is going to try again. Right. So I guess that's um, sort of splitting hairs. I'm having trouble thinking whether... Um, systematic discrimination is something that the FCC is concerned about, wants to see not happen. But is preferential treatment the same thing? What I meant to say there is that it would be one thing for your ISP to say, okay, we're going to strike a special deal with Hulu and we're going to exempt them from the cap in exchange for so many million per year. Nobody else should even bother applying for this. It's a good for Hulu only versus them selling generally. Anyone who wants to pay us so much mm -hmm. per aggregate gigabyte will be exempted from our caps. Right. So the, the latter would be okay with the FCC, one would hope, and the former would Maybe. not. Maybe. I, I don't know. I'm, I can't read their minds. They've right. made all kinds of strange decisions in the past, both legally and politically. So it's very hard to predict, but the signals seem to be that they'll look for something that they can squeeze back into the 706 box and call a puppy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the poor little puppy back in the box. Uh, Evan, anything else to add here? My gosh, I hope they figure this out because what if we have to live in a world where I cannot have over-the-air broadcast television streamed to my mobile device someday? So <laughs> we've really got to figure it out. Uh, that sounds like a segue to Aereo. It does, indeed. <laughs> Are we ready to go there? <laughs> go well, I've been off... this forever, so uh, uh, don't yes. leave it to me. But um... uh, one, one last question on uh, the, the D.C. Circuit's decision. Uh, the First Amendment was uh, floating around in there as an argument, and it, it did uh, not make its way. It was not a persuasive argument, is that right? And and does the First Amendment play any further role in the analysis going forward? I, I think it's always oh, it there a, in the background. Uh, it's, yeah. Go ahead, James. Feel free. I was going to say it didn't play a role because they didn't have to get to the argument. Right. So They struck could, down could, enough of the rules on statutory mm -hmm. grounds. They just didn't get to the constitutional question. Yeah. Right. So the answer to your question, Denise, is it, it's it's still there and it could play a role uh, in the right case uh, in the future. It just didn't play a role here. Okay, good to know. All right, let's move on to something a little bit more entertainment and Hollywood focused, although it's all, you know, of a piece uh, and talk about area. Uh, so what we don't have here is a definitive statement from the Supreme Court yet. Uh, but what we have is a promise that we will have a definitive statement from the Supreme Court as they have granted cert uh, at the request of the losing uh, networks in the Second Circuit. Um, and also at the request of Ario, who came in and said, hey, we don't oppose. Uh, you, you want the Supreme Court to take a look at this, and so do we. So um, the Supreme Court said, and yes, we will. So, uh, James, where do things go from here? The Supreme Court is, uh, I should explain what Ario is doing for yes. viewers. You it's should. a service that takes live over-the-air TV 
and lets you essentially have a DVR in the cloud. They will record any program you want that's being broadcast in your area, store it for you, and then stream it back to you on any of your computers. What makes this interesting, especially so, is that they will stream it back almost live. As soon as it starts recording, they will stream from that buffer to you. And this fact that it's coming from a unique copy led the Second Circuit to say that this is not actually a public performance. It's a private performance because it's your copy going only to you. So the audience capable of receiving it consists of exactly one person. One person is not the public. Therefore, area doesn't trigger the broadcaster's public performance rights in the content they're airing. And the broadcasters flipped out about this because one of the big things that the 1976 Copyright Act did was bring cable TV rebroadcasts within copyright. It said that to retransmit over the air TV, you have to get permission and you have to pay a licensing fee. Broadcasters say, oh no, the sky is going to fall. We're going to lose our licensing fees. This is the end of the world. You have to shut them down or you will kill cable and turn it into just over-the-air, ripped-off TV. Take this case, please. Hmm. You would have normally expected Aereo to say, no, 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 please wait, let other courts weigh in on the matter. Except for the fact that you have this remarkably disreputable company called Filmon, which mm -hmm. basically took the first decision in favor of Aereo, re-architected their systems, they alleged, to work the same way, and relaunched. Well, the result of that is that Philmon has been racking up loss after loss in courts around the country. So Aereo is, of course, terrified that if the Supreme Court doesn't take the Aereo case, it will take one of the Philmon cases. And then, uh, that means a case with a pretty sketchy defendant in front of the Supreme Court. Aereo would rather have matters being handled by its own very good legal team than have it in the hands of somebody else. Thus, the early review. All right, I'm going to go ahead and make film on conspiracy our first MCLE passphrase for this episode mm -hmm. of This Week in Law. If you are listening to this show uh, for MCLE credit in your jurisdiction or other professional credit, we put these passphrases in the show so that you can demonstrate you actually listened. We drop them in at random and uh, there will be one more before the show is over. And the reason I mentioned film on conspiracy is uh, there are some people out there, James, who think that Film On is somehow being funded by the networks who are pursuing Aereo to go out there and uh, make bad law that harms Aereo. Do you think that there's any grain of truth in that? I'm pretty skeptical about that. Alcavati's David, who is running Film On, is sort of a notorious gadfly in this area. He's an extraordinarily colorful character, very ambitious, very energetic. No reason to resort to conspiracy theories. What can be explained <laughs> simply by the American entrepreneurial spirit at its most colorful. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> All right. So uh, we, we don't have um, any sort of circuit split that the Supreme Court is going to be resolving here, but it is going to hear the case and, and give some definitive guidance as to whether these uh, tiny little antennas making individualized copies are indeed copyright infringement. Do you care to ballpark that for us, James? It's an interesting case because it's at the intersection of two lines of authority. On the one hand, you have a lot of cases that come from cable TV and rebroadcasts that say public performance whenever you take a signal and we send it along to new recipients. On the other hand, you have a line of cases going back to Sony, which is 30 years old now, and holding that consumers have a fair use right to make their own recordings of things they have ordinarily received, and that that's not infringing. What Aereo has done is take the VCR, shove it, pull it up along the cable from the consumer's home into Aereo's offices, but now you have the convergence of home taping and broadcast. So the case turns on the classification question. Is this a rebroadcast of TV or is it a home recording the consumer made? And based upon how you characterize that, the case gets slotted in one of two tracks and it either looks presumptively like an infringement or presumptively like a fair use. Evan, which one do you think it looks presumptively like? 
I have no idea what the court is actually going to find on this because I think if you read the the briefs, which are very persuasive, if you read the broadcaster's opening brief in the um, in front of the Supreme Court, or if you go back all the way back to 2007 and read Judge Chen's opinion in the Cablevision case at the district court opinion, and re- look and you really analyze and evaluate this definition of public performance, which is, which is in Section 101 of the Copyright Act, where we get the transmit clause, where all of this is focused, edem logically, definitionally, uh, where, where the, you know, at least the copyright portion of this rises and falls. Well, I guess it's all the copyright portion, but not the, not the cable retransmission part that, that James was talking about, this, this public performance aspect of it. Uh, you know, you can, you can see it both ways. There's something, if, if we just back out and look at this from a common sense perspective, um, you can you can say there's just something that's not quite right. I mean, you've got to be coming at it from a certain perspective with certain biases or prejudice, what have you. But there's just there there seems like something. Uh, there, there there's there's always some dissonance that at least arises in my mind when you look at what Ario is doing to think can this really be something that is not triggering a legal obligation to pay royalties or licensing fees? Maybe that's because I've been. Uh, you know, my, 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 I have been effectively brainwashed now into the corporate <laughs> mentality and, you know, I am just a, a Borg and, uh, you know, I'm a pawn in the big corporation's army. Um, but, yeah, you know, all, I don't, all silliness I don't think aside. So. I mean, when you look at Aereo, you look at a company who built a business off of a legal loophole, basically, um, read that cable vision decision and decided we see a way forward here and it's tiny little antennas. You know, I mean, it's certainly not the most efficient way to do what they're doing. Yes. And, and there and, was a lot of, of mm-hmm. a lot of finagling, a lot of finessing that they had to do with the language in that transmit clause to get it there to, you know, in the cable vision case to overturn what judge Chin had said there. And, you know, there's a lot of common sense when you think of, and I don't want to necessarily get in and parse the language too finely on this, but the transmit clause talking about it being a public performance, if you transmit or display a performance, so the definition is already a little bit circular, a performance is the display or transmit of a performance, you know, it's problematic to, to linguistically to begin with. You know, there's this this real problem with the fact that there is a legal distinction that the future of the broadcast industry rise or falls on as to whether or not it's a particular copy stored on a particular hard drive made available to exactly one person versus whether it's more like um, a, a counter behind a hotel room that has uh, a bunch of VCR tapes and one copy of each movie, but it can allow different people in the rooms to, to watch it. I'm going back to the on-command case in 1991 there, the facts of that case. You know, the, the whole question rises and falls on these really very small factual nuances that you know when you when you when you jump back out at this general common sense level it's like why on earth should it matter why on earth should such should, should such fine factual distinctions play such a consequential role uh, for the, for the whole thing and that's what gives me um, uh, you know uh, that's why I'm reluctant to to bet on how this could could come out. And, you know, and I don't know that we should presume the Supreme Court's going to give us anything definitive because posturally, <laughs> procedurally, we see just the, it was the denial of a preliminary injunction. So I think there's all kinds of things that the Supreme Court could do without yeah. avoid, or, you know, to avoid giving us a real definitive answer on this. They've certainly done it before for us, you know. Yeah. I think the, the, the problem point. here is, is Congress's. Uh, if there's, uh, if there's a, problem you have to point to the language of the public performance right um and uh you know i mean the the language is difficult i mean it may not be you shouldn't necessarily expect congress to always get it right on the first try um but in part for reasons that evan just suggested uh in part because you have to have some respect for um, for Aereo, uh, you know, sort of finding this loophole, building this Rube Goldberg machine to fit within the confines of the Rube Goldberg statute, but they did an amazing job of it. Um, uh, I think, I think a lot of people share Evan's um, uh, sort of two sides on this. It seems like what mm-hmm. they did was probably, um, in a very narrow sense, permissible, but it seems very clear that it wasn't intended to be permissible, uh, and. 
it, it's possible that the Supreme Court will be able to correct it. Um, uh, but again, for reasons Evan suggested, that's not I'm not very confident of that, which means it ultimately is going to fall to Congress, which probably should have enacted something, some kind of a, an exclusive right to make available rather than relying on the, the, the public performance right, uh, which again, if appropriately worded, although it'd be a lot easier, would would deal with this whole problem. We wouldn't have Ario to be concerned about in the first place. Yes, uh, I think Sherwin C. would agree with you. He has a great uh, little piece over at uh, the Hill um, it, arguing, uh, it's a retrospective on the Betamax case and uh, on the principle uh, that personal home recordings are fair use and and looking 30 years down the road as we are here now um sherwin argues that congress needs to ease some of the burden placed on fair use and i'll read from him here by creating a clearly defined right for people to make personal non-commercial copies and adaptations uh his piece argues that copying is more pervasive and more essential than it ever was that every time you're using your computer you're making copies uh, and that, you know, in the way technology works today, copies proliferate and what we need to be uh, worrying about is whether use of those copies is legal or not. So, James, do you think that, I mean, we haven't had Congress uh, remedy that problem and say um, copies in and of themselves cannot equate to infringement. Um, but do you think that that kind of consideration will play a role for the court, that the court is going to um, look at the fact that there should be uh, more opportunities for innocuous copying to be uh, deemed fair use or otherwise not infringement? I hope so. One of the things, and Evan mentioned the unusual procedural posture of this case, in response to denial of a PI, is that the broadcasters brought the case on a very narrow theory. They brought a motion for a preliminary injunction and took their appeal and their petition on the theory that what Aria was doing is direct infringement of the public performance right. A very focused statutory claim. But in doing so, they didn't bring any claim for the copies that Aereo makes when it records programs, the copies that it's streaming from, the copies that, according to the Second Circuit, mean that it's not a public performance. Nor did they bring any claim based upon their secondary, Aereo secondary responsibility for infringements committed by users. And those other routes, I think, give you a fuller picture of what's happening in the case. And in particular, any secondary infringement theory brings in users' fair use rights. It brings in the question of whether home viewers who already have access to the programs being broadcast over the air in the area have a right to store copies of that. And so that does require you to face a difficult factual fair use question. And I think for that very reason, the broadcasters simply ducked it. They stipulated that off the table in the Cablevision case, and they brought a motion here in this case that didn't raise that theory with the hopes of making the entire case hinge on this statutory question of the public performance right so they can say the sky will fall if we don't get what we want here. But it's true that while Congress hasn't fully done its job in defining the scope of the exclusive rights, this is an area of copyright in which the courts have played a very active role, encouraged by the Supreme Court, of using common law doctrines to spell out the full extent of contributory liability and fair use both of which have been explicitly encouraged by Congress. So I would hope that the Supreme Court will lean on this power that Congress has encouraged the courts to use to, for themselves, create a coherent system around the exclusive rights rather than treating everything as a question of what the text will bear. Because if you do that, you have a set of rights that are quite old and have not really kept pace with modern technology. Yeah, there is absolutely no way that Congress could have even come to close to envisioning this magical thing that Aereo is in 19. <laughs> I mean, if they started writing this in the you know the the mid 70s or you know, the early 70s, right? I mean, there was the problem right. with those two cases about cable retransmission, which I think could portend to where this would go if the Supreme Court comes down on the broadcaster's side and finds that this is an infringement and essentially undoes 
not only what Aereo is doing, but also undoes cable vision from 2008 and puts us back to the world as it was in, in 2007. I think you would see, uh, you know, you could see something then of, of Congress stepping in and, um, well, I don't know. I mean, could, I guess it wouldn't be if, if cable vision is undone, but if it upholds this, I'm sorry, I got it flipped around. You know, if it does uphold this as a, uh, a situation where there is no infringement, then you could see Congress stepping in uh, very politically charged, you know, having the broadcast industries do some very heavy lobbying to, to see something like re uh, a new statutory scheme of retransmission fees being put in place, just like they did in the mid-70s after those problematic decisions where picking up over-the-air signal and retransmitting it uh, by a coax was uh, not an in infringement when the Supreme Court held that. Well, I don't know if you intended to, but you did raise an interesting possibility that the court could use this as an excuse to go back and undo the cable vision case if it wanted to. Right. Uh, I mean, that's, you, that would be the yeah. effect. I mean, I think there's no way that it could. This is confusing, so I want to make sure I say it right. I mean, they couldn't mm -hmm. find against Aereo without also undoing cable vision, could they? Because it, it rises cable and falls vision. on that same tran, trans, uh, uh, transmit clause. Cablevision certainly thinks they could do just that. Cablevision has this wonderful white paper out, which says, in essence, our service is legal, but nobody else's is. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. So they're distinguishing themselves from Aereo. And another possibility is that the Supreme Court finds a way to make what Aereo, Aereo and <laughs> Film On and potentially others uh, want to do legal and finds a way to make it more efficient. In other words, you need not use tiny little antennas anymore. You can be a central uh, antenna and, and broadcast out. What do you think the chances of that are, James? That strikes me as somewhat unlikely because mm -hmm. it would be very hard to reconcile that with the text of the act without simultaneously making cable an unviable business model when it comes to retransmission. Mm -hmm. That seems very unlikely. There are other distinctions they could search for, but I think reading away the individual copies version, that's a long shot. Mm -hmm. All right, Jeff, any final thoughts on this? Um, well, I, I was just going to sort of e echo what, uh, what James just said. I think, um, uh, and as Evan also uh, suggested it's hard to talk about this without talking about uh, the old retransmission consent regime and the compulsory license and the whole thing is somewhat of, of a mess I believe um, and uh, perhaps the the best to be hoped for here uh, I'm not exactly sure what ruling by the Supreme Court would induce this but the best to be hoped for is that uh, is that we see a, a comprehensive revisiting of not just the the performance right and and again i do think that that could could and should be be rewritten to encompass uh, making available right um but but also the retransmission consent compulsory license regime that that is um tied up with it and i i'd, I'd like to see um much too much done there to discuss in the few minutes we have now but i think a lot needs to be done there all right. Uh, not sure where to go here. Let's uh, put another MCLE passphrase in the show and make it um, spring, <laughs> since that's when this case will be argued. Uh, we'll look for the Supreme Court to have its final say on this sometime in the spring. Uh, so... Let's move on here and uh, I want to talk since we have James on the show. A uh, very big decision in Google's favor came out uh, late last year uh, in the Google book search case. Uh, Google won, Google won big. Uh, there is an appeal pending. The Authors Girl Guild has appealed it. So I just, uh, James, was hoping you could recap the decision, uh, let people know why it's important and uh, what the future may hold on appeal. Okay. This was a decision in the very long running Google Books case. Google mm -hmm. started scanning books borrowed from libraries back in 2004. The authors, guilds, and publishers sued them in 2005, saying you can't scan books to use in the search engine. 
And the case has wound its way through the courts up and down for years. There was a settlement that was rejected. It went back to litigation. The publisher settled. The authors finally took it through to a decision, and the district court found it was fair use. In fact, two district courts have found fair use, one in the suit against Google's library partners and one in the suit against Google itself. And they've said, in essence, making a search engine from books doesn't infringe rights of the copyright owners in the books, that you're really appealing to a completely different audience, and that it's transformative because you're using the books for a different purpose. Telling people where to find something on a topic is just a completely different use from reading a book to understand it. The authors unsurprisingly don't like those rulings. They've appealed both of them. The oral argument in the case against the libraries has already been held. That didn't go so well for them. The judges, both at the district court level and on appeal, were very sympathetic to the fact that the libraries were making their collections accessible, and especially making them accessible in full to visually disabled patrons. That's a use that you couldn't really get without digitizing books. And so the courts have been very sympathetic to the idea that here you are promoting the progress of the arts and sciences by enabling an audience that was previously completely unable to access these books in any reasonable way and bringing them the full fruits of the knowledge contained in them. All right. So uh, then do you think that uh, this is the end of the line here? Do you think anything is poised to change on appeal? My best guess is that the Second Circuit is going to affirm in both cases. Mm -hmm. You have indications from the judges in the case against Google who actually reversed the district court's grant of class certification with an opinion that suggested they thought that Google had a pretty strong fair use case. If the decision, the case comes back before those same judges, I think we're likely to get a ringing fair use endorsement in favor of Google, and that's likely to be the end of the matter. All right, sounds good. Well, the uh, Supreme Court has been up to uh, other things as well. Evan, you pointed out that in addition to the uh, grant of cert in Aereo, uh, there are some important patent decisions that the Supreme Court is going to be taking up. Can you tell us about them? Are you muted? Yes, yeah, I was doing yes. an Ernie Svensson, if we go, <laughs> go back to the old days. Um, was It gave me time to remember the, 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 the case name. It was the Akamai and Limelight, Limelight Networks yes. uh, case. That's the one that I was paying attention to, having to do with in, uh, inducement liability, uh, whether or not it's, a, it's an infringement if one party is actually performing all the steps that are listed in the, in the patent. So there's some interesting things that could result from that. It's, it's something that's very particular to the internet because we've got distributed computing and people doing different things at different places in the world. So the, the results uh, for, for that coming up uh, are interesting uh, for, for patent law in as much as they, they pertain to the internet. And uh, my, it's escaping me now the other patent case. I know it was much more of a you know, less internet-focused patent that was uh, that were the case. But there was, there was the, the patent case, the two patent cases. There was the, the, uh, the Aereo case going up, and then there was a, um, uh, like a false, there was a, it was a um, kind of a Lanham Act case, uh, kind of a, a wonky side issue on that as well. So there'll be four intellectual property cases uh, in the next uh, term uh, in front of the Supreme Court. So be some interesting things to, uh, to be reading in the next, in the next uh, few months as those things come out. So the Aereo is not the only thing. No, not at all. And uh, James, do you think uh, any of these other cases are going to give us uh, something interesting to chew on down the road? They may well. The Supreme Court has been on a tear reversing the federal circuit recently, and mm -hmm. the patent cases that it's taken on definiteness and divided infringement give it big chances to do that. The case that it took earlier in this term, CLS Bank versus Alice, on subject matter for technological computer patents could let it do that in an even bigger way. It has the two Lanham Act cases. It also has uh, a case on copyright and latches. This has been a big, big term for the Supreme Court taking IP cases. All right. Well, what we're used to here in my neck of the woods in California is the Supreme Court slapping the Ninth Circuit on the wrist. Mm -hmm. uh, in a uh, privacy case, it declined to do that. So let's talk about that one next. So 
So one of the most, uh, one of the topics that people who watch and listen to this show are most interested in consistently are uh, what can uh, folks, officials do to my gadgets uh, at the border? Um, what kinds of information do I have to turn over? Um, what sort of examinations of my devices can be done? And uh, the Ninth Circuit uh, issued a decision uh, that uh, border agents can uh, search uh, a gadget um, just like they could a suitcase or a vehicle. Uh, and it, uh, I, that was the district court's decision. The Ninth Circuit um, said that uh, more was going to be needed, a reasonable suspicion of criminal activity. And the justices at the Supreme Court declined to mess around with that ruling. So um, a rare uh, win for digital privacy and a rare hands-off uh, Ninth Circuit, you got it right from the Supreme Court. Uh, Evan, uh, what do you think? Did the Ninth Circuit get it right? Well, I mean, it doesn't do anything to make us more comfortable that the Border Patrol agents will be looking at our stuff when we try to re-enter the country. I mean, they can still do a search of your computer, at least a, a cursory search of it uh, when, when you come in. So it's not like the Fourth Amendment has gotten a big boost or a shot in the arm from the Supreme Court's decision not to take a look at what the Ninth Circuit said here. We do get a bit of assurance, though, uh, in the uh, that if the Border Patrol agents... Uh, want to do more sophisticated forensic analysis in the facts of this case where the guy was coming back up from Mexico and they sent the laptop, I think, to, I want to say to Tucson or something like that, you know, 170 miles away. That's what requires the reasonable suspicion. So it's not like they can get in and do some real detailed forensics right there uh, for no reason at the border or even have it sent off. They've got to have something, uh, you know, there's got to be something that's based on. This case, um, you know, it's such a cliche and, it, you know, I get on my own nerves when I say it, but, you know, bad, mm. fa bad facts make bad law. I don't know if there was necessarily bad law, but what I do know is that there were some bad facts for the particular defendant in this situation here. You know, he had been, he had some, he had a criminal history for, um, uh, I, I don't, I don't want to defame the guy, but I know that it had, you know, there was some, some, un, un, uh, you know, not, not, not great stuff in his past. There were some password protected files. Uh, he was coming back from a spot that was known for sex tourism. So there was plenty of, there were plenty of facts to support uh, the actual search that happened in this case. So this particular guy, his life did not improve because of the court's decision, even right. though there is this aspect of it that does, in a certain sense, bolster the notion of the digital privacy that we can uh, enjoy when we try to reenter the United States. Right. Jeff, are you uh, comfortable when traveling abroad that, that you are know, you know, you're one of the brightest uh, minds in our nation on legal issues, <laughs> that you know for sure what uh, Border Patrol agents can and cannot do with your devices? No, of course not. I don't think anyone knows. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't think that. I don't think this ruling particularly helps. Um, right. It's still kind of divided. It's. Um, I haven't looked at it very closely, but uh, as Evan was suggesting, there's some things they can do and some things they they can't do. Um, so uh, uh, I, I do think that this is um, it, w whether they've whether the Ninth Circuit and then affirmed by the Supreme Court found the right line or not uh, is uh, is certainly an open question. And it certainly doesn't end this. This will be going on for a lot longer. This didn't really resolve much of anything. Okay. James, any uh, any thoughts on border searches or this decision in particular? No, but I should add that the Supreme Court took two cell phone search cases today. They agreed ah, to review you two cases going in mm -hmm. opposite directions about whether the government can search your cell phone when you're arrested without further evidence that it contains something incriminating in a search warrant. So right. very similar, so they have but one in, appeal the, in coming the, from the government arrest context. And one from the defendant. Right. All right, we will keep an eye on those then as well. Um, Denise, can, when can, we, can we talk about Apple? Ahead. Can we talk yes. about Apple before we go? Yeah, definitely we're going to talk we don't about have Apple. To. Let's, I just Yeah, I want to. Let's do that. Uh, this is uh, the decision that Apple 
is going to have to pay a $32 million settlement to uh, folks who had in-app purchases made on their iOS devices uh, in response to complaints that they did not um, sufficiently prevent children from making unauthorized purchases on their parents' account with, uh, unauthorized without their parents' consent. So um, now Apple is going to have to reach out to consumers and uh, pay out 32.5 million in refunds. Um, it's, I think it's gonna be hard to figure out, you know, exactly which in-app purchases uh, would um, fall within the the spirit of this repayment. Um, I don't know if they're going to have to uh, try and parse that or not. Jeff, what's your take on it? Um, well, a couple of things. But first, I would just add they've are they are there is already a class action settlement in which Apple agreed to pay a hundred million dollars and also. Uh, independent of that $100 million, I believe, to re refund money for just about anyone who basically asks for it, who says this was uh, a result of this 15-minute window. Um, mm -hmm. So one initial question is, is what the FTC's uh, settlement adds to what we already got uh, following the uh, the class action settlement. I should also point out that the the conduct that was at issue here, this this 15 minute window. So what happens? What used to happen is that if you authorized an in-app purchase, the first time you did it for the first in-app purchase, uh, you had to enter your password, and it would open up this 15 minute window of access to the um, the Apple account, which, if I have this correct, would apply even if you went to another app and tried to make an in-app purchase there. If it was in the 15-minute window, um, you wouldn't need to re-enter your password at all. Um, that actually has been changed. That was changed in 2011. So again, it's not entirely clear what we get out of the um, the FTC's action here. But to me, the most important thing here is the way the FTC went about its case here. and. Um, uh, uh, Commissioner Wright, in his dissent, uh, uh, gets this uh, exactly right. If the only thing he doesn't do is um, is is get as apoplectic as I think he should, um, uh, the 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 test that the FTC apply the, the the statute the FTC is applying the unfair acts or practices prong of the of the of Section Five of the FTC Act really does require. Uh, a kind of balancing. The injury has to be substantial, and substantial, as it's been interpreted, in, implies a certain amount of um, of balancing of costs against benefits. Um, and it's pretty clear from the decision, uh, from the the majority's uh, uh, opinion here, that um, uh, they implicitly decided that the benefits of this were zero. And it didn't matter how small the costs were. And in a, in a important ways, they were really minuscule here. By the way, I should point out, this isn't a COPPA case. This is the risk here. The, mm -hmm. the, the problem here was not harm to children. It was harm to parents who might have Harm to, to the pay. pocketbook. Ex exactly right. Yeah. Um, uh, so the, the costs were, were, were pretty de minimis here. Um, and the FTC seems to have decided that they don't have to look at the benefits and can substitute their own judgment uh, for Apple's uh, decisions about how to design its products. And under the assumption that there's nothing important in, say, the 15-minute window that might confer any consumer benefits. That could be the case, I suppose. Um, but the fact that Apple thought differently and the fact that the FTC didn't undertake any kind of analysis to establish that the costs were greater than the benefits benefits uh, suggests otherwise. And uh, I find that to be extremely troubling and problematic. We've now got a potentially entirely different approach to uh, unfair acts or practices under Section 5 of the FTC Act. And um, uh, again, I worry whenever government agencies have that kind of authority. Yeah, so presumably Apple put this 15-minute window in there uh, on the assumption that if you're authorizing one purchase, it's going to be inconvenient. Uh, you'd probably be authorizing the next series of purchases in that game or in other games, and it's just going to be a pain to the consumers and too much friction on their end to make the person have to come back. Yep, enter your password again and again and again and again. Um, but so what you're saying, Jeff, is that the FTC, you know, is substituting its judgment for. Um, that of Apple and the parents and the FTC is saying, 
uh, look, this is just, you know, too big an assumption and you should, uh, there's too much, but you say there was no balancing here. So the FTC no. did not go through the analysis of saying, you know, it's just too much risk if uh, your kid can spend $2,600 in 15 minutes. Um, so I, I think that people would probably agree um, that it's, a good thing that Apple had to to fix this issue, but do you think that the fines that it's been hit with are too stringent, or just should have been imposed in a more um, thoroughgoing uh, with a more thoroughgoing analysis behind them? Uh, very much the latter. I don't, I don't know if mm -hmm. the um, well. I mean, I, I, as I said, they've already paid a, a hundred million dollars uh, for for the same mm -hmm. conduct. I don't know that another thirty two point five million or whatever it was is uh, is warranted. I don't think Apple is that concerned about thirty two million dollars. I mean, you know, it's Apple. What are they? They that's uh, that's um, you know change found in the cushions, right? Um, okay. But um, it's the mode of analysis that that I think is is should be troubling for uh, for everyone. Um, I mentioned the 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 balancing test, the countervailing benefits uh, part of this. Um, there's another part of Section Five that they also didn't really deal with, which is that um, in order for there to be a a problem. It also has to be the case that the harm is not something that was reasonably avoidable by consumers. This is like the very definition of something that's reasonably avoidable by consumers. Oh, come on, if, Jeff. If you <laughs> look, if you are worried about your kid, um, uh, you know, being able to, to make in-app purchases um, during the 15-minute window, uh, then uh, there are things you can do uh, to ensure that that um, they don't have your iPad or your iPod where your back is turned during that 15 minute window. Um, and yes, I, I am a parent. And yes, I do hand my iPad to my kids. Yeah. And yes, by the way, they have once ordered a magazine uh, without me um, uh, uh, authorizing it. And not one I that I wanted. I think the problem though is the, the 15 minute window just was not something that was very well publicized. You know, I've, I've certainly um, authorized purchases for my kid uh, on iDevices and without ever thinking that for the next 15 minutes he was going to have carte blanche. <laughs> well, but he, and notice he doesn't have carte blanche, right? All you have to do is get out of that app, and even if you're going back to it, and uh, and carte blanche is, uh, as you put it, is is ended. That didn't used to be the case, as I said. So that only yeah. it came about in 2011, uh, and maybe it's it's the publicity that was the that was the issue. It's interesting then that um, uh, that. Um, we didn't have a ruling from the FTC or essentially a settlement um, that, that may have looked very different, but that basically was just Apple agreeing to uh, implement that whatever kind of notice might be required. I mean, the, the, the order, I think, is going to change the way they engage, operate here, and we don't know exactly what that's going to look like. It's up to Apple, Apple to determine that but you would have thought you would have thought that apple might have suggested some options and they were i must have that must have happened the ftc must have either rejected them or or perhaps it didn't happen and and the ftc suggested some ideas that apple rejected um but i think it's interesting that we don't have that uh, uh have that here because you're right it seems like in some sense the solution is is fairly simple um but then I, I go back to what I said before. I think it's pretty important, especially for a company like Apple that puts so much stock uh, in the minute details of the design of its um, uh, of its products. Um, if they decided that that it wasn't a, a good um, user experience to have a maybe a screen pop up that says, you know, you've now authorized purchases in this app for the next 15 minutes, um, then I think we should take that very seriously. And again, I think the FTC simply disregarded that as a potential benefit of the 15 minute window, whether, as I said, it ultimately is worth more not to have it. Um, that, that's a, an analysis that perhaps the FTC should have undertaken. And I think they're obligated to undertake under Section five, but they didn't, and that's what I find to be really problematic here. Yeah, James, what were you going to say? Oh, the two thoughts to follow on this. One of them <laughs> is that the reasonably avoided standard makes extensive reference to what people would know about or what they could expect to happen. So the problem is not so much that a fifteen-minute window is a bad design decision, but if you're going to have that design decision, consumers need to know to expect it because they need to know oh, wait, once I've entered my password once, I can't hand this back to my kid for the next 15 minutes. So the design decision is 
the conjunction of that window with the failure to explain it well. And I have very little problem in saying that that's a bad design decision, the sort whose con harms outweigh its benefits, and that it's reasonable to tell app providers don't do that. And this is in, important in the larger conversation about the FTC not just settling with Apple over its conduct, but sending a signal to other providers. Because if I think about all of the free-to-play things that depend upon in-app purchases and all of the games that are marketed that way, I think it's actually important to have this on record telling other companies, don't do this. This is a form of unfair conduct. The FTC will come after you even if the class action lawyers don't get you. Well, why, why so to that extent, it, I'm not surprised well, that Apple settled or that the FTC went after them. Well, it might be one thing to call it deceptive. Um, and deception doesn't require a balancing test. And uh, um, it, the way you even talk about it, it potentially sounds like deception. But to call this an unfair practice and to be able to jump to the conclusion that you did, that you have no trouble saying that the costs outweigh the benefits here, um, uh, I mean, that's fine. You're allowed to do that. But the FTC actually isn't allowed to do that. The FTC actually has to uh, you know, uh, do some analysis before they get to that point. You can't simply make that assumption. Uh, I'm sorry, the FTC can't simply make that assumption. Um, so uh, to be open up the, the door to unfairness um, liability on, on, uh, in such a, a case by removing the, the very important, I think, balancing uh, that's required under the unfairness authority under Section 5 um, and not to pursue it under deception um, uh, which they may not have done for other reasons. Uh, all of that strikes me as, as really problematic and unnecessary, even if you, everything you said is true. And even if you're right that we need the FTC to step in because parents can't police this themselves, which I, I think isn't true. Even if all of that is true, it's not at all clear that that needs to be done under the unfairness problem. Well, I completely agree with you that the FTC can and should be better at explaining the basis for its decisions. I would like to see better written records in the cases. I think it's less of a problem that they don't do it as well as you do, but I agree that they should be better about explaining. Well, hand, it's not a matter of explaining, though. I mean, I mean, it, Commissioner Wright wouldn't have written the dissent he did if they had managed to to do this behind the scenes and simply didn't include it in the in the decision they wrote. I find that problematic as well, but but that's a different matter entirely. Um, uh, Commissioner Wright is here saying. They just didn't do it at all. It, it doesn't exist in a drawer in the staff's office somewhere. I never saw it. I, the commissioner, never saw it. Let never mind that you never saw it. Are you okay? are you comfortable with that? I agree. It's, you know, it's one thing that they don't explain these things enough because I'd like to know yeah. more. But it's a real problem if the commissioners don't know enough. Well, if the quality wonder, of the cost-benefit analysis and commissioner rights uh, weighing is the standard we're going to hold the FTC to, I'm pretty concerned actually. Because his denominator there is actually Apple's total sales of all iOS devices, which That's is not completely not the trade-off we're, we're making here. The question That's is true. what was it's the picture. cost of doing it a different way? Right. And that cost is actually quite small compared with the unauthorized purchases made through the system. I think anecdotally, we all either have had an unauthorized purchase made or we know someone who has and it, they're not insignificant. You know, I'm definitely keeping friends in the loop about these decisions because they're going to be either class members or, you know, benefits, uh, benef beneficiaries of this uh, FTC fine. I can think of one family down the road where the son was buying hundreds of dollars worth of fish in a game <laughs> that uh, the parents had no idea about because it must have fallen within this 15 minute window. It's not because he just was using their password willy nilly. It's because he was excessively um, using the permission that they granted him. Uh, Evan, were you impacted by this at all? Uh, no, no, I wasn't impacted by, you know, having my, my kids buy anything like this. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I just think it raises some interesting issues, uh, some some kind of notions that are baked into to all this notion of the apparent inability of, of parents to 
supervise the conduct of their of their children online. I mean, if you know, if this is if the if we're going to approach this from the ability from the standpoint that the parents lack that ability and they don't undertake those efforts to make these supervisions, and the FTC has to come in and be uh, you know be very paternalistic in this regard. Uh, you know, that's that, that 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 could have some some broader implications if put into some other scenarios like. Uh, you know, if if you were to go back in time and apply these these notions to you know ten years ago to file sharing litigation, you know, well, it was my kid who actually was on the internet using Kaza to you know download this MP3 file. Would that have made those types of arguments that a lot of defendants in those situations made more effective? If we're going to have this normative notion that parents shouldn't be expected to to supervise what their kids are doing. Uh, on on the internet, uh, making purchases, downloading content, uh, what have you. So, as a societal issue, I think that's that, that that's interesting to ponder. All right, before we get to our tip and resource, I uh, wanted to close the loop on something we discussed on the show. Let's see, it was episode two thirty four that we actually named "Tech Policy Meets Traffic Court" uh, about Cecilia Abadie and uh, Larry Downs opined, you know, do you really want the traffic court making tech policy decisions? And that's exactly what's happened here now. Uh, I was just uh, yesterday that Cecilia Abadie uh, got her day in court and she did uh, fight the citation she got for driving with Google Glass. Uh, she also was cited for speeding and she beat both reps. Uh, she, uh, the court found that there was no proof that she, her device was actually on when she was driving and uh, somehow she beat the speeding uh, count too. So um, Cecilia, congratulations. And uh, there we go. We have uh, California traffic court, uh, at least reading the um, California statute and deciding that uh, there had to be proof beyond a reasonable doubt that if you're going to be um, cited for driving while a video or TV screen is on, that there has to be proof that it's actually on. So um, I don't know that it actually uh, made policy here, but uh, it uh, certainly is the first decision that we know about where um, someone was cited for driving with glass and it's, uh, it, the court found here that uh, that wasn't a problem. Uh, so Evan, any thoughts on this? Uh, well, I mean, I guess I would just uh, go back to what I've said earlier. I mean, this is, I don't see this as the, even having the potential of being a watershed uh, the decision on this, it looks like it came as, as we expected, it would came down to some very specific facts. Apparently the prosecution, the states, the government side on this failed to carry its burden of, of proof. So, you know, I mm -hmm. don't think there's much uh, effect of, of looking, uh, you know, too much into this or making any, um, uh, you know, any pronouncements from it. You know, there was the interesting, the, the CNET article that we read about this, you know, I certainly wouldn't join into the sensational and sensationalism of saying that she has been cleared of being a menace to society. Sure. <laughs> Fine. Well, She's mean, not a menace this, to society. <laughs> maybe this is a, an object lesson to legislatures out there um, who are trying to grapple with uh, this issue that, you know, you can't, you maybe can't or shouldn't hang uh, guilt or the ability to cite someone on proving whether something's on or off, because how can you really tell that? How can a, an officer tell if someone's wearing Google Glass and the video screen is on or off? I mean, I, I, I take it there's a light that comes on, but you know, how are you going to tell that from a patrol car um, while you're both driving along the road? Uh, something to consider in the lawmaking equation. Any thoughts on this, Jeff? Uh, no, nothing in particular. I, uh, I'll just reincorporate by uh, uh, whatever the right phrase is, whatever Larry Down said. I'm sure I agree with that. <laughs> Incorporate by reference. See yeah, Larry Down. Yes, exactly. yes, I think what Larry Down said is we need to let uh, innovative technologies uh, develop and not, yes. you know, perhaps they could be more helpful to drivers and uh, other drivers on the road than uh, than not using glass, and we need to let all that shake out. Uh, James, Sorry. what do you think? I think you can solve most of the issues with this case by just passing a more general law that lets the police arrest anybody wearing Google Glass for bad judgment. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> the glass hole law. Yep. 
<laughs> right. Well, see, it's actually that's at least consistent with uh, with James's views on the on the Apple case. So you know, there also the the <laughs> possibility of countervailing benefits are simply discounted, which is what happened. Here. <laughs> Uh, there we go. All right, uh, let's move on. I have um, a couple of tips and a resource for you all. Let's start with the resource, uh, EFF and others, including Creative Commons, New Media Rights, uh, the American Association of Law Libraries, and many other uh, organizations have declared that this week that we are in right now is Copyright Week, and they have been doing a campaign of education and awareness on copyright issues. If you go to EFF.org slash Copyright Week, you'll see all of the things they have been highlighting there. Um, appropriately enough for the themes of our show, this week today is all about fair use rights, and there are a number of resources and um various uh, ways of helping you understand the complicated issues around fair use uh, highlighted at that link for today. So uh, happy copyright week, everybody. And then our tips of the week are twofold. Uh, first, with regard to bandwidth caps, which we spoke about quite a bit, uh, whether or not they're going to be around for the foreseeable future, I guess has to do with what happens with the sponsored data plans we were discussing earlier, but they are around now. And uh, Google has a functionality in Chrome now. If you're using uh, Chrome on an Android uh, device or iOS, uh, if you go into your Chrome browser on those devices, uh, you have to be using the latest version. You go to settings and then bandwidth management, and you'll see an option that reads reduce data usage, and you have to turn that on. And uh, that's going to help you use less bandwidth as you go around the web and do things. Um, it'd be interesting to see, uh, I don't know what sort of statistics they have on um, uh, how much they're going to save you uh, and how uh, many bits this actually um, conserves, but uh, go try it yourself and find out and see if it makes a difference. Uh, also on the Google front, uh, Google's helping you there, but you may not have thought it was all that helpful when Google integrated uh, Google Plus and Gmail messaging. And I've noticed a few times that I've gotten um, some emails that I would not have received because uh, they're being sent to my Google Plus account. That's now going to my main Google email address. Uh, if you find that that's not something you like uh, over at EFF, Adi Kamdar has some instructions on how you go to your Gmail settings and uh, change the email via Google Plus settings so that you no longer, um, people can no longer email you uh, in that way without knowing your email address. So um, it's kind of a long link, but if you go to delicious.com slash thisweekinlaw slash 242, you'll find it there as well as links to everything else that we discussed on the show today and a bunch of stuff we never even got to because there's been just too much good discussion about what we have touched on. Uh, we could not have done it and shed such great light on these important developments without the help of James Grimmelman. James, you uh, we love having you come on the show and today was no exception. We really, really appreciate your time. And I know for me and I trust for those who watch and listen, I feel uh, much more secure in my knowledge of what's happened this week. So many thanks. It's my great pleasure. And that goes for you too, Jeff Manny. We are so thrilled that you could join us once again. And uh, again, that our timing was so propitious that we could have you on this week when um, the Second Circuit obliged and issued its decision. It, it was great fun as always. Kudos to your, your prescience and ability to plan this so well around the release <laughs> of the uh, DC Court Opinion. Yes, we, we try to peer into the future as much as possible. Uh, Evan, we've been really fortunate about that of late. Let's hope it uh, continues to pan out, such as when we um, inadvertently scheduled Professor Goldman for episode 230. Right, yeah. Good luck <laughs> continues. Yeah. 
<laughs> so, That's great. I didn't know that happened. That's great. <laughs> yes. No, that, that was really fun. Uh, next week, we have Gabriella Coleman and Lisa Barodkin on the show. So we'll have to see what things happen between now and then that are, are particularly in their wheelhouse. We hope you will join us then. Uh, if you do so, uh, that will be at Friday, 11 o'clock Pacific time, 1800 UTC is when we record the show live. If you can't join us live, of course, you can Pick us up at your leisure if you go to twit.tv slash twill. Our archive of shows is there. Also, if YouTube makes it more easy for you to access the shows, we have a channel there, youtube.com slash thisweekinlaw. We're on iTunes. We're on Roku. We, as yet, don't have any sponsored data deals, uh, but <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll keep you posted along those lines. I'm certainly hopeful that uh, we're able to continue uh, competing on a level playing field with... Um, the rest of the people who offer uh, broadcast sort of entertainment online. Uh, Evan, any final thoughts? No, no. It's uh, been been a lot to talk about, a lot to unpack today. So it's so it's been it's been quite a bit of fun, I would say. It has been. Uh, well, let's go to Jeff and James one last time. Jeff, uh, anything else um, that our viewers and listeners need to know about that uh, you want to highlight before we sign off today? Um. I want to highlight again the importance of the Apple decision and the uh, uh, and the Verizon decisions. Um, uh, I can think, keep on the lookout for uh, what Congress uh, might potentially do in rewriting the Telecom Act. I wouldn't hold my breath, but they're at least making some moves in that direction, and we should definitely watch that and continue to watch uh, what they do, what the FCC does with the uh, IP transition, uh, which is uh, also uh, impacted by. Uh, the DC Circuit's decision and uh, and how the FCC responds to it. Any good uh, talks or discussions coming up? You guys at Tech Freedom always have wonderful people involved in panels and uh, trying to unpack issues, much as we have done here today. Uh, anything that we should know about? Uh, let's see. Well, we'll definitely do something on uh, net neutrality coming up uh, pretty soon. I think within the next week or so. Uh, we haven't gotten that nailed down yet. Um, I can't. Honestly, uh, I, I wish you'd asked me that I was going to be asked, told me I was going to be asked this question uh, before the show, and that. I would have, uh, I can't remember offhand, but um, uh, I, I also can't think of anything right now. So I'm sure well, there will should... be many more interesting things coming up. Yes, and folks should regularly check back at Tech Freedom because you guys cover very important issues and have very thoughtful discussions about them. Uh, James, Thanks. anything on your plate? Well, we had President Obama's press conference today about NSA reforms. And I'm sure that people who care about privacy will be parsing his presidential directive very closely to see what it does and doesn't allow. Other than that, keep on trucking. Great. So there's your assignment, folks. Uh, go out and bone up on all the NSA stuff that we have not touched on this week. Uh, but we'll do so in the future. And uh, we're so glad that you could join us. Uh, do get in touch with us if you have comments, suggestions, questions following this show, uh, suggestions for topics and guests in the future. Evan is Evan at twit.tv. I'm Denise at twit.tv. You can find us on Twitter. He's Internet Cases there. I'm D Howell there. Or go on over to our Facebook or Google Plus page and uh, our Google Plus community, which I've started monitoring a little bit more actively. It's sort of crept into existence on its own and organically. And uh, so I guess we should definitely uh, monitor that as well. And we're going to do so. Uh, and uh, we love hearing from you. We love your feedback and participation in the show, uh, whether live or after the fact in any of those ways I just mentioned. So we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of This Week in Law. 